behaviour and balance, motor function generally, what's it all about? This is a cheetah, and if you ask me, that's impressive. That's doing about 70 miles an hour, about 100 kilometres an hour on rough terrain. That's what motor function is all about. But watch it again. And watch the cheetah's head and the cheetah's eyes in comparison to the body. The body, particularly the back end, is going up and down, up and down, jumping and bobbing, and so is the front end. But the head and the eyes are just moving through one plane in space towards that antelope. <coughs> Not only is the body propelling the animal forward at that fairly impressive speed, but it's providing a perfectly stable platform for the eyes and the head so that the head can concentrate on what it's doing, which is moving towards lunch. And that's where posture comes in, because posture is the component of movement that provides that stable environment for the body in space. Works out where the body is in space, how it's moving through space, and what to do to get it to where it wants to be. So, balance, first of all. Balance is one of the most important sensory parts of posture, but as we will see, there are others. This is a human here. Hope the diagram is better. We talked about the cochlea and the sense of hearing last semester. We're going to talk about the other function of the inner ear this morning, which is the function of this part, the function of balance. Horribly expanded caption from that, but balance is a function of the semicircular canals with their sensory organs, the ampullae, one in each canal, and then here the utricle. And we'll talk about each of those in turn. The semicircular canals sense angular acceleration or angular change of velocity. And notice, I'm sure you're aware already, that in each ear there is one semicircular canal in each plate. They're at perfect right angles to each other. So that together they can give you a complete picture of the direction and magnitude of acceleration, angular acceleration. Also interesting to note that in the other internal ear, the three semicircular canals in that internal ear are perfectly aligned with the semicircular canals in this internal ear, which is quite a neat trick really. So the whole system is working together to give a picture of acceleration. The utricles are sensors of the apparent direction of gravity. <coughs> so in this system we've got which way is gravity pulling me and how fast am I changing my rotation and movement through space. All done by hair cells. We met hair cells again last semester and we were talking about how they're used as transducers of a sound wave when they're attached to a cochlear membrane, which vibrates with sound and so vibrates the hairs. But in the utricles and the ampullae, those very same hair cells are put to quite different use by the nature of the transducers that they're built into. They're still position sensors, they still alter their membrane potential with the position of those hairs on the hair cell, but because of what they're attached to, they sense different things. And you'll remember, I hope, that the hair cells are position centers. They relatively depolarize if the hairs move one way and relatively hyperpolarize if the hairs move the other way, and they don't accommodate. They're absolute. So here's an ampulla in a semicircular canal. <coughs> or at least it would be if I drawn the semicircular canal. But the canal comes out here, goes up around the top, and comes back in down here to provide a complete circle that's fluid filled with this little baby sticking into it. And these are the hair cells down here in this membrane with their hairs and implanted into this gelatinous substance. So, we spin the head in this direction and because the semicircular canal is fixed in the skull, the semicircular canal rotates with it. But because there is low friction between the fluid and the semicircular canal, the fluid doesn't accelerate as quickly as the semicircular canal tissues, and so tends to flow in this direction through the ampulla, or through, yeah, through the ampulla, and puts a pressure here which distorts this over to 
this side. Alters the position of the hair cells, and so we get a sense of angular acceleration. And the same the other way, when the head either stops spinning and the fluid is still spinning, or when the head spins the other way, the fluid tends to spin the other way and forces the ampulla in the other direction. <coughs> this is the response of a hair cell in the ampulla to a period of rotation. Take somebody and sit them on an office chair and spin them round or subject them to one of those nasty fairground rides or whatever, and this is what their hair cells will be doing. There's the usual tonic level of discharge. <coughs> rotation begins and the level goes up. Notice for a period of constant rotation the response goes up and then comes down again. And then at the end of the rotation it stops and then comes up again to its tonic level. Now I said that hair cells don't accommodate and they don't. What's happening here is the physical system is accommodating. The low friction between the fluid and the semicircular canal is beginning to spin the fluid and eventually with a constant rotation the fluid spins at the same rate as the semicircular canal that it's in. There's no more force distorting the ampulla and so you get back to your tonic level of discharge. And that's why they are measures of acceleration and not measures of velocity. That's also why it's just as easy to throw up when you come off a fairground ride as it is to throw up when you go on a fairground ride. <laughs> the utricles there, the same hair cells, this time embedded into a dense stroma, a sort of matrix of tissues that has within it heavy ions, calcium and sulfate and all sorts of heavy things which tend to weigh down. And so as the head tilts from side to side, the force of gravity acts on this in a different direction. The head tilts this way, gravity acts in this direction, the otolith, the stroma, moves, takes the hair cells with it, and so they sense the direction. And going the other way, exactly the reverse happens, and we've got that same sense of directional change. This is a view looking down onto the surface of a utricle, or an otolith, which is the stony thing that the hair cells are embedded in. And this shows you the preferred direction of sensitivity of each of the hair cells that's embedded into that otolith. So that each individual hair cell senses movement in a single plane, forwards and backwards. That's how it's built. But because of the way they are embedded, pointing in every different direction, this organ will sense gravity in three dimensions, in any direction, because if gravity starts to pull this way, then you'll get these hair cells responding. If gravity <coughs> pulls this way, these won't respond at all, but there are some up here that are perfectly lined up. So by the magnitude of the response, and which of the individual hair cells are generating that response, we can sense the apparent magnitude of gravity and also the direction of that gravity. All of this information feeds into a system which we call the vestibular system, which is the primary centre of balance, and is centred around the vestibular nuclei in the brain stem and the cerebellum. So what inputs have we got? And we've covered all of these inputs now, so we can talk about all of them with some degree of understanding. I hope. The visual input we did last semester. You'll remember that the visual input comes in through the optic nerve and diverges <coughs> in the midbrain, and some of that input goes off to various different places, like the um, tectum and the cerebellum and the motor nuclei of the eyes and so on. Well, this is picking up some of that input now, so we've got the whole of the visual pathway feeding into this, picking up some of that visual input taking it to the vestibular nuclei and pretty much asking the question, where's the horizon? Okay? The eyes, in terms of balance, are concerned with keeping an eye on where the horizon is because that, in normal circumstances, gives you an in, a, a good idea of which way up you are in space.
again, fairgrounds take advantage of that and can twist the horizon in those nasty tunnels that you sometimes are persuaded to walk into, usually after several beers too many, and the horizon twists over and it gets really confusing and really unpleasant. That's because the visual input is saying, hey, gravity's this way, and the utricles are saying, now gravity's that way. And you're kind of saying, which way is it? Which way is up? The proprioceptive input and the cutaneous input together give us an idea of the position of our body and the position of our centre of gravity. We've talked about proprioception and about joint and muscle proprioceptors giving the body a picture of what shape it's in in space, how its joints are bent, what tension is in its muscles. The cutaneous input for us in our two feet, but for quadrupeds in the bottoms of all four limbs, sense how much force is going through that limb and feed that into the vestibular nuclei, again, to pick up a picture of how our position is in space and how it's changing in space. And finally, the vestibular input that we've just talked about, all feeding into the vestibular nuclei. And in conjunction with the cerebellum, the vestibular nuclei have three sorts of outputs. <coughs> There's an output to the limbs and the torso, altering the posture, keeping us in a reasonable posture to accommodate where we are in space. I don't know how many of you have tried this, and again, <coughs> please don't try it at home, or if you do, don't say, I suggested it. But if you fall over to the side or backwards, it's actually very hard to fall over and not kind of put your leg out. You know these sort of comedy people that can sort of go, oh, and fall right over onto a mattress or something? It's very difficult to do that, and I actually can't do that. I can't make myself fall to one side without, at the last minute, putting my foot out and saving myself. And that's because my vestibular nuclear is saying, hang on a minute, gravity's over there, you need a leg over there, and making my limbs and torso move a limb over to support my centre of gravity. Similar nuclei have an output to the ocular musculature, and this is the loop that we described when we were talking about the sense of vision. Yeah? The visual input comes in, goes through the midbrain, through the vestibular nuclei, comes out in the ocular musculature, and moves the eyes in an appropriate space. So that when your eyes scan over a wide vista, you don't just scan it evenly like that, you fix on one point of space and then fix on the next point of space and fix on the next point of space all the way through so that you've got several steady platforms of vision as you move your head and we call that saccading. The sudden movements that the eye make are called saccades. And finally, we've got an output to the conscious centres which allow us to perceive our motion and to perceive our orientation so that we know where we are. Okay, let's talk about how that sense of balance feeds into posture. Two more animals illustrating the two different postures that mammals tend to exhibit. First of all, the elephant. The elephant carries an awful lot of weight very efficiently, but isn't exactly what you call balletic. If you look at the orientation of its long bones and its limbs, they are stacked up on each other like pillars, with very straight angles at the joints. And that's a good posture for carrying a lot of weight very efficiently. But it's not exactly a very responsive posture. In contrast, back to our friend the cheetah, the cheetah's long bones are all at fairly acute angles. And so it's supporting its much reduced weight in quite a different way, supporting its weight on the tension generated in its extensor and flexor muscles, more than the compression within its bones. And if you want to understand the advantages and disadvantages of those two different postures, try waiting for three hours at a bus stop like this and see what happens. And then go for a game of squash and wait for somebody to serve to you like that and see what happens. Okay? When you're like this, your energy efficiency
efficient, but you're not exactly responsive to a changing environment. And when you're like this, you're much more responsive to a changing environment, but you can't do it for a long period of time. It uses a lot of energy. And so light, agile animals tend to go for this approach, and heavy animals sacrifice some of that agility and go for this more energy efficient approach. Now let's talk about why this is more responsive than this. What's changed between these two that means that this animal can respond to physical changes in its environment more quickly and easily than this one? You'll remember in the first lecture we talked about the EMG in the monocymatic reflex arm. And we said that if you strike the patella ligament with a patella hammer, there is a delay before you get any electrical activity in the muscles. And that delay in this one that I measured is of 24 milliseconds, thereabouts. So what we're saying is, if something comes along and tries to move your limb <coughs> in any given direction, it's 24 milliseconds, a 40th of a second, before you can do anything about it. And in the world that we live in, that 24 milliseconds is a good long time. If you're a cheetah, for example, now, I got my 12-year-old to work this out last night, and I can't quite remember, but he worked out that that cheetah goes back 10 metres in that 24 milliseconds. So, if it was relying on this activity, this electrical activity, to respond to its environment, it could potentially go 10 metres before it could respond to an unexpected stimulus, a lump in the ground or whatever. There's no way it could run at that speed doing that. This is what actually happens, and here's a model of two long bones with a joint here. Imagine it to be an elbow or a stifle or whatever, with an expensor muscle and a flexor muscle set up as springs with a tension on the spring. Now, without any neuronal activity, <coughs> if you attempt to extend this here, you will increase the tension on this string, uh, spring and decrease the tension on this spring, and the system will tend to oppose you. It will tend to remain where it is. And if you try and flex it here, you'll reduce the tension on this spring and increase the tension on this spring, and so it will try and extend and oppose you. So it's automatically... <coughs> opposing whatever environmental input comes into it. And if you like, maintaining the status quo in a flexible way until some neuronal activity comes along and tells it to change what it's doing. And so it's a much faster, much more responsive way for a musculoskeletal system to respond in its environment. So we've talked about posture in an individual joint, what we need to do now is we need to put together a series of postural reflexes which orient the different joints together so that we have a series of postures that feel natural and respond well to the environment. And the postural reflexes do three things. They alter tone in the postural musculature and they do that in response to support reflexes and attitudinal reflexes. The support reflexes are the reflexes which support us in space. And if I find my weight rocking forward onto my toes as I'm standing, then I naturally tend to increase the force in my extensors and decrease the force in my flexors to push against that force. And it's just like the reflex we were talking about in the second lecture, the spinal reflex, where when you feel something pushing against your hand, you reflexively push against it, unless it's painful for you. So what you're doing is, you're altering the push that you exert on the environment in proportion to the way the environment pushes on you, and that tends to keep your posture the same, supports your posture. And secondly, we've got the attitudinal reflexes. The attitudinal reflexes tend to support particular positions of limbs in sort of line with each other. So if I tend to walk down a the street or in a lecture theatre, this is how I tend to walk. Yeah? This leg and this arm go forward together and then this one goes over. Okay? Now I can, if I really think hard about it, walk like this. Yeah? It's called pacing. And I can just about do it, but the minute I forget about it and walk naturally again, I go back into that swinging stance. That's what 
what my reflexes are telling me to do. So those reflexes, if you think about it, must have sensors in these limbs and motor effects in these limbs, and sensors in these limbs and motor effects in these limbs. They're long reflexes. They go up and down segments of the spinal cord. <coughs> those are the attitudinal reflexes. Other reflexes which you'll meet, and we will talk about some of them, are the famous crossed extensor reflex. The crossed extensor reflex says, or acts such that, if I tend to have one limb flexed, it feels natural to extend the other limb. The crossed extensor reflex. And also, it feels natural to flex this limb and extend this limb. Yeah? Any of you want to try this when you're in bed one night? Just lie there and flex this limb and you'll find that you'll tend to sort of sleep like that. Yeah? And if you do it the other way around, you flex this one, you'll tend to be like that. Yeah? It's... No, like that. There we are. It's really difficult to feel comfortable like that. It just doesn't feel right. Okay? And the other way around. And it's really difficult to feel comfortable all balled up as well. You just tend to feel that it's right if you've got opposing limbs extended and flexed. Uh, segmental supporting reflexes are just like the supporting reflexes within a segment. No, they are the supporting reflexes within a segment. I'm talking rubbish. Let's go on to the next slide. Here's an example from a cat. Famous cat on a hot tin roof. But if you look at the cat, <coughs> excuse me, when it's climbing up the roof, it will tend to have its head up its forelimbs flex and its hind limbs extended. And that's reflex. That's just how the cat's built <coughs> so that it feels like that. And if it's walking down the ways, it will tend to have its head down, its forelimbs extended, and its hind limbs flexed. And those are all spinal reflexes. <coughs> if you took the spinal cat that we were walking on a treadmill at the end of the second lecture, and altered its treadmill to go up and down, it would be able to adjust its posture like that. It wouldn't be able to sense gravity, so it wouldn't do it as well, but it would do it through the force on its four limbs, and as you move things up, it just adjusts its posture in line with the way that force is acting through the body. Cunning. This is an example of a clinical sign that bases itself on these reflexes, and it's called schiff sherrington syndrome. This is a dog that fetched up in an emergency clinic that I was working at. It had a complete flaccid paralysis of its hind limbs, and its forelimbs, it could control them, but it had this extensor rigidity. So its forelimbs were coming down like so, and its hind limbs completely flaccid. What's happened is, it's broken its back somewhere between its hind limbs and its forelimbs, usually in the high lumbar region. That's the sort of site that most dogs that injure their spine in that location tend to injure it. Because if you think about the thoracic vertebrae, they are much more tightly lashed together with the ribs and all those intercostal structures which hold it much more steadily. It's much harder to break it back in the thoracic region than it is in the lumbar region. So this dog has a serious fracture of the spine and compression of the back in the high lumbar region, which is causing a flaccid paralysis of its hind limbs. Four limbs are an extension because that injury has also damaged those reflexes which pass up from the hind limbs to the forelimbs. And because all those reflexes tend to be inhibitory, particularly inhibitory on the extensors, what's happened is the lower motor neurons in lamina 9, in the area of the brachial plexus, are not getting as much inhibition as they should be doing, as they normally would be doing. And so we tend to get a spastic extension of the limbs. And in the dog, 
with all those bilateral spinal pathways that we've been talking about, that kind of sign, schiff sheraton syndrome, is an extremely bad thing prognostically. A dog that has schiff sheraton syndrome or has had it at any time is extremely unlikely to get better. Okay, let's talk about the writing reflexes. There are four writing reflexes, and every time I put this slide up, I convince myself that I'm going to remember to get them in the right order before next year. But I see that I still haven't done. So we have the labyrinthine writing reflex, the optical writing reflex, the neck writing reflex in third, and the body writing reflex. <coughs> As the names suggest, <coughs> the labyrinthine writing reflex has a sensory input from the vestibular system, or the labyrinth of the inner ear. And the optical writing reflex has an input from the eye, the visual input. Both of those reflexes are responsible for orientation of the head. They both work together to orient the head correctly in space. The neck writing reflex orients the neck in line with the head. And the body writing reflex orients the body in line with the neck. So that the final is that the whole of the animal, head, neck and body, are all lined up with gravity and with the horizon. <coughs> and you'll see that, and again don't do this at home, you'll see that if you pick up a cat by the legs and drop it. Okay, if you do that, you'll notice that I only have drawings of this, not photographs, because I like my cats. If you do that, the first thing that the cat will do is, it will get its head the right way around. It's its visual writing reflex and its labyrinthine writing reflex to sort its head out. And then it will get its neck right with its head. Then it will get its body right with its neck, which is already right with its head. It kind of unscrews itself in space, screws itself round from the head first. And finally, once it's all straight, it will get into a nice landing posture. Hence, cats always land on their feet. 